you fake in the background. We're good to go. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Professor Philip Lumley. I'm the Deputy Head of College of Medical and Dental Sciences. I'm uh, a dentist, and I was previously Head of Education in Dentistry, and following that, I was Head of the School of Dentistry before entering into my uh, current role. So I work in the University of Birmingham. I've been here uh, since 1984. And I also work in an honorary capacity in the uh, NHS. It's my pleasure to uh, chair this session uh, today. Thank you very much, those of you who are here in person, and a very warm welcome to all of you joining us online. The first thing is I'd like our panel just to uh, introduce themselves. So if we could go. Uh, along the uh, line of introductions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is John Kerno. I'm Director of Education in the College. Um, my name is Maril Hariri. I'm COG Vice Chair and I'm coming to represent the medical school. My name is Erin Hamilton. I'm a fourth year dental student and I'm representing dentistry. Uh, my name is Ajmal. I'm the previous pharm pharmacy senior rep. My name is Keshat, I'm a children's nursing student and I'm the Nursing Society President. My name is Laura, I'm a third year biomedical scientist and I was last year's student representative. Thank you very much and a particularly warm welcome to all our student representatives for coming and helping uh, John and I with this introduction. John, could I ask you to uh, come up and give your uh, presentation please? Thank you very much. Um, so I really don't need to introduce myself again, but I'll do it just in case everyone missed it. Um, so I'm John Kerno. I am Director of Education in the College of Medical and Dental Sciences. Um, that effectively means that I'm responsible for anything to do with all the education in the college, which can be daunting at times. Um, got about 5,000 students, so that certainly keeps me busy. Um, so look, a very warm welcome. It's uh, good to see at least a handful of you in the room. I think there have been some competing activities on campus today that might have kept some people away. Uh, for those online, uh, I realize many of you are actually in Birmingham online. Um, it may not even be just gone two o'clock. You might be watching this at midnight for all I know. Um, we also, of course, have some international students who um, are actually not even in Birmingham yet. Uh, we hope that you manage to get your travel organized and can join us hopefully very soon in the next weeks uh, on the campus. Very much looking forward to having you here. Um, so I think the first thing to say is um, well done. Uh, your education obviously over the last 18 months has probably been horrendous. Um, and I think you've all done incredibly well to get through it, to get the A-level grades that you have achieved. Um, and we're absolutely uh, thrilled to have you here. Um, it's a privilege for us to uh, carry on your education uh, whilst you're with us at university. Um, and I would say it's an absolute delight to see students on campus. It's been too quiet for too long. Uh, it's a bit of a shock to the system, I must say, going from almost nobody to a full campus, but it, it really is fabulous. Hopefully you're also feeling exactly the same having really not seen that many people for that long, uh, you're now immersed in this huge uh, hot pot of, uh, of students and staff, um, and I hope you very much enjoy that whilst you're here. Um, so the College of Medical and Dental Sciences, I mean, you're each coming in for a slightly different uh, degree program, um, but hopefully you're aware that you know, our, our mission really is about the future of health and medicine uh, we have very innovative education, exceptional research that you'll be exposed to um, during your time here. And we have a fantastic group of world-leading academics uh, that will teach you, will support you uh, through your education, uh, as well as our professional services staff that are absolutely pivotal um, to delivering uh, that educational and student experience for you. Um, now, I could talk about academia a lot, but I don't want to bore you with that. Um, 
really, really want to just mention, you know, we have some student representatives here. Um, they're representing the discipline, but also they're representing more than that. They're representing what goes on outside of your studies. Um, life at university is a fantastic thing. There are so many opportunities available to you, and I encourage you to make the most of those. I can guarantee it is the best time in your life to make the most of other opportunities. Try something new, get involved in the societies. It's generally a good thing for you. It'll improve your general mental well-being. Um, you get introduced to other people from different programs outside of your discipline. It's just a fantastic thing to get involved in. Um, so please make the most of those opportunities whilst you're with us. As I said, we do have um, a student representation system. So the Guild of Students uh, has the student rep system. They are really critical for the staff at the university as well. Um, we need to understand your student experience, what's working really well for you, what's not working very well for you, what you feel maybe should be changed. Um, so the communication between our students and our staff is really pivotal to guaranteeing a really fantastic student experience. So even if you don't become a student rep yourself, engage with those student reps. Most of the programs now actually run live Q&A type sessions, um, often online now, of course, uh, sometimes face to face, where all the students on a program can t come together with the senior staff in that program just to discuss the issues of the day, what's, what's been a problem for you that week or that, that month, um, and try and explain to you why something's done a certain way, or come up with a solution and listen to your, the problems that you're having. Um, so as I say, maintain that dialogue, uh, a really important part. Um, now even just looking around this room, you'll realize that we have a huge diversity of student population. We pride ourselves on the diversity of our population but we especially pride ourselves on being inclusive. And that means that we are this inclusive community that has to have absolute respect for every other individual, be that another student or a member of staff. So we have a zero tolerance policy. We do not tolerate harassment of any form. And if any of you feel that you are being harassed, it's really important that you flag that. There are various reporting systems. You'll find the information on, on the web pages. Um, and we take it very seriously and we will deal with any issues that come up. I don't want to talk about a negative side of the student experience, but I think it's really important from the outset to make sure that you all know that you are supported and that we do generate an inclusive environment. Um, and I think the last thing I want to say, because I don't want to talk for too long, because we want to get some questions from you, um, is really about the pandemic, about COVID. Um, you'll notice that uh, most of us have masks on. Um, as a college, we are expecting our students and our staff uh, to wear masks when they are indoors, when they're in the medical school building or elsewhere on campus. Um, I've not got mine on now because I'm at a large distance from you, so I don't really need to do that. Um, but you'll see when I sit back down, I do put my mask on. Let's hope I remember now. Um, so please bring them with you, please put them on. We can't mandate it. This isn't about being able to tell you that you must wear them. We are a community. It's important that we protect each other. If we don't help to protect each other, then the case numbers will go up. Uh, you as students will be off sick. The staff will be off sick. It impacts on your education. So if we can just act together as a community, I think it's the best thing we can do. Some of you will have exemptions, of course, and we very much respect that. There are lanyards available if you get fed up with people asking you to put your masks on. Um, so if you want to wear those, they are available. Um, of course, remember about your hand washing as well, and remember about being outside as much as you can. It's a bit easier this time of year than it will be in January or February. Um, nonetheless, um, keep windows open when you can. Ventilation is a really important thing. So all of that guidance that's available, please do go through the web pages. There are loads of FAQs on there, uh, so please have a look at those. Um, so really that's all I wanted to say. Again, just a huge welcome to all of you. We're so thrilled to have everybody back, um, and I will hand back to Phil as we go through to some of the Q&A. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John. 
Now, it's, it's now my turn to actually give an apology because there's a slide that goes up in here that uh, gives you the website for Slido and gives you the login code for Slido so you can actually ask some uh, questions. And I should have lingered on that uh, so you could have logged in before John spoke. Uh, so there it is. Um, so uh, sorry, everybody, for that, in particular the organizers who did give me extremely uh, clear instructions as to... Uh, as to what to do. So I'll just give you a few minutes to log in, put the code in, and then fire away those uh, questions that you've been storing up, and they will come up on my uh, screen here, and then I will refer them to the panel. I'd like to echo what John said about university and the uh, best years of, uh, of your life. Um, I had a fabulous time at uh, university. I worked hard. I played hard. I've still got uh, a lot of friends that I met um, at, uh, at university. And again, if I didn't like the university environment, I wouldn't have stayed in it for, uh, for so long. We have questions now. Thank you very much. What's something you think all students should know before starting the medicine course? Okay. Um, so as a medical student, um, there's a bunch of things that I really would have wanted to know before starting. Um, I think I might have missed this in the introduction, but I'm a third year medical student. Um, something I really wanted to address is a bunch of myths that people associate with med school. One of them being is that you will have no social life. I feel like as a medical student it's very important to look out for yourself mentally, socially and academically. Yes, granted the course might be intense at some points, but there's always chances to do things outside your course, chances to promote your CV, chances to make friends and reach out and network. So if you go in with the mentality that Granted, my course might be hard at, some, at times, and sometimes I need to focus on my studies, but I will have time to do things alongside it. You will go a lot further. Also, there's a mentality that did take me quite a while to adapt, and I would advise people to adapt as soon as possible, which is, if something is meant to be, it will be. So, m medicine might be competitive for some, but there's a lot of opportunities to go around, and it's okay if you don't get something that you go for. It's really important to put yourself out there because putting yourself out there, puts, even if there's a minimal chance of it happening, it, put, it, may, it puts that chance into place. Whereas if you haven't even gone for it, it's a zero chance. The likelihood of it's happening is not even there. So I would say take the chances you can take and just trust the process. If it's meant to be, it will happen. And last but not least, the main advice that I wish I was given as a medical student would be time organization, time management. Um, make sure you put everything you can do during the day, during that. And something that I learned and I would recommend for students to do is put what you need to do that day and then add points. If I'm done with what I need to do today, then I will do these. You will be much more satisfied knowing you've met your brief points and set realistic expectations. If you can take off more of the extras, you'd be happier. But at the same time, if you couldn't, you know you've met what you needed to do for the day. And um, yeah, these are my advice or what I wish I would have known so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, how much of the teaching do you expect to be done in person? Thank you, John. I guess I ought to pick up on that one. Uh, so let me very, be very clear. Uh, these are campus-based courses. Uh, unless we have anybody who's studying a distance learning course who's listening online, which I, I doubt, but in case you are there. Uh, so we run campus-based courses. We are back on campus. Your teaching is back on campus. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not some online material available to you. So when you log on to your Canvas page, you may not have gone, gone as far as that yet. That's your virtual learning environment. You will find online material. Some of that will be recordings of lectures or probably parts of lectures, little videos. Uh, that is available to you to study in a flexible manner. But your sessions will be on campus, your lectures, your tutorials, your labs, your skill sessions, uh, back on campus. That doesn't mean that occasionally you won't have an online teaching session. So please look out for those in your schedule. Um, 
for various reasons, uh, mainly to do with uh, occasionally a member of staff may be self-isolating, for example, and we'd much prefer them to still deliver that teaching session if nobody else is available than to cancel it. So just keep an eye out on your timetable. Look at it fairly frequently because it, it may have some changes in it. Um, and for a few other reasons, perhaps there might be the odd session online. But I am pleased to say that we are back on campus. Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, in terms of career guidance, uh, John, will this be provided post-course? Um, I've just been asked to take my mask off to make it easier, I think, for people to hear. So, But I'm facing that way, so I think we're okay. Um, yeah, is one year long enough for a master's course? Uh, well, it is. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't do them that way, of course. No, look, it's a fair question. Um, I think you'll be surprised as a master's student just how much depth we go into in the course of a single year. Uh, they are quite intense courses. It's worth you knowing that from the beginning. Uh, so do keep up at the very start or you might get left behind. Um, there's two full semesters of, of taught elements and then you go into your dissertation project. And it's really when you get into that dissertation project that you begin to embed yourself in the depth of that subject. And remember the, you know, the university you're at here is a very research intense university. So you're being taught by the experts that understand this knowledge at that depth and you yourself will be a part of that research when you're doing your dissertation project. So I think for those reasons, we feel that one year full time is, is sufficient. I know that differs from other countries, but it, it's certainly the way that we teach it here. Thank you. I think it's another one for you, John. How will the increased number of students taken on this year affect the learning experience? Yeah, very uh, pertinent question. Um, so I'm sure most of you are aware that we have had an increase in student numbers coming into the first year. Uh, for medicine, we have about an extra 50 students. Uh, pharmacy, I think an extra 40 or so. Um, nursing, about another 120, 140. Um, we've planned very well for this. Uh, we were aware it was likely to happen, so there was some planning that went on before we knew the numbers. It should have a minimal impact on your teaching. Uh, we've employed additional staff. Uh, we've got additional teaching spaces that we've converted. So some of the cafes, for example, um, for staff are now teaching spaces. Some of the research rooms are now teaching spaces. Um, we've got more personal tutors. Um, we're organizing all the additional placements, of course, which has probably been the biggest challenge. So whilst there might be a few minor differences here and there, on the whole, we think we're very much prepared to teach these increased numbers. Thank you very much, uh, John. A question around biomedical uh, sciences. Do biomedical students get the opportunity to work in labs during the summer? So Thank you. It's, it's completely up to you. So I think if you're doing biomedical science, what you'll realize quite quickly is some people absolutely love being in the lab and some people don't. Um, and you might change your mind, so don't put too much pressure on yourself to decide. Um, but if you do enjoy it and you do want some more experience in the lab, um, then there are various summer opportunities. Um, you either look out for those posted on Canvas and they'll be... Um, they'll be shown to you as opportunities that are already there. Or if you're particularly interested in something or you're, you particularly like a member of staff that's been teaching you, uh, they always do recommend that you get in touch with them and ask to see if there are any opportunities, um, whether they could welcome you into their lab or whether they know of anyone else who would be able to. Um, so it's really very flexible and there are loads of opportunities. So um, you just have to keep an eye out closer to the time. And also loads of external summer opportunities as well in first and second year. So it's all about doing as much research um, individually and also just reaching out to people to ask for their help as well. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, very practical question here. Can you have a part-time job as a medic? Um, so, um, as a medic, personally, I did not have a part-time job in first year, just so I can see how things run and to see how I can manage it. First year, content-wise, is considered easier than the years after it. So I would see 
just judge the scope of your timetable if you're able to handle that. If you're able to handle that, I would say you can do a part-time job. I worked on campus from September as a welcome week assistant and then as a campus marshal all the way till June. And um, this could be different because I worked on campus, but I would definitely recommend looking out for work on campus via WorkLink. Uh, a lot of them are available and are very flexible. They would accommodate your schedule and they ask you to indicate your availability. So in scenarios like that, I think it differs from one person to another. I personally was able to handle it. It also does depend on the job and how intense it is. I would say have a look at WorkLink if you're interested in applying within university. See if it works out. They're very flexible. They're very understanding. If it works out, you can either take on more shifts or stick to the hours you've chosen. If it doesn't work out, you can decrease it or you can either find another job or just focus on your studies. But I'd say it's definitely feasible. However, it does depend on one person to another and it does depend on the job you're undertaking and where it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what advice would you give to local students that commute that may not have the typical university stroke campus experience? Are any of you commuter students? So, Yes, I'm a commuting student. Um, I think just planning your time and making sure you're getting your studies in, but also being able to go to societies. Most societies do run around 6 o'clock, so you will have time after university to go to them. But I would recommend um, planning your days out and make sure you know what you're doing and what you need to do for that week. Thank you. When do dental students first get placements? So... Thanks for the question. In first year, we had the opportunity to observe uh, mainly fourth and fifth years. And then in second year, you can actually assist those students in dental nursing. Um, and they are trying to get to patients for the July in second year. Um, that didn't happen for my cohort, but that's something they're really striving for. And then in third year, you start, um, we started patients in September and have since then. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, could you comment on the medical placements? Oh, yeah. Um, so in terms of medical placements, you get different types of placements. So you get GP placements, and then you get placements within trusts or hospitals. As a first or second year, assuming a first year is asked that question, uh, for first year you get placement every other week. It could have changed now due to COVID, but when I was a medical student, it's every other week. What I've heard from students is that it is going to be every other week. However, going into placement is going to be in smaller groups, so you won't get to go in as much. However, you will still get the opportunity. If you're in a GP placement, the main thing you do would be history taking, brief examination, and communicating with patients, because this is where you want to solidify your um, communication with patients. Third year onwards is your clinical years, and this is where you get where you're on placement for most days of the week. You get allocated a hospital each semester, and then it changes, and um, you get allocated different wards each semester or every uh, few weeks. You get to experience how that ward is like or how that specialty is like. You get to um, do some of your clinical skills that you've learned in year one and year two, for example, taking bloods, um, other like in sorts of injections. Um, so yeah, I feel like both of them are completely different experiences. You also do get GP placement in um, fourth and fifth, in, in third, fourth and fifth years. Uh, but yeah, you don't get as much patient contact in the first two years. However, it's very valuable. I personally found it. And I feel like it was quite a good basis for me to interact with patients third to fifth year. And um, yeah, I'd say make the most out of it and do not be scared to like approach patients and talk to them. And if you feel like there's a clinical sign that you heard of that your GP tells you that patient has, please go ahead and ask them if you can examine their chest or their abdomen or whatever it may be. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. And a follow-up there, how often do you use books in medicine? Um, okay. <laughs> um, I think that's actually one of the myths about med school as well, is that you're going to be swarmed with a lot of books. Granted, I do know a lot, some people who are swarmed with a lot of books, but um, I think, again, it does depend on the type of learner you are and the type of person you are. So I'm personally a visual learner, so I would prefer to, for example, book a slot in the library in medical school and have an examination of the models. I would like to go to my prosec sessions and see them for as they are I, YouTube videos. Some people, on the other hand, they like highlighting. They like having actual text. They cannot do, deal with virtual ones. 
some people can deal with virtual or in-person books, so I think it does depend on your style as a learner. In terms of books, I know a lot of people might be stressing about which books you can find, because with medicine, a lot, as, as I'm sure with you guys' courses, there might be a lot of books for one topic. Um, for that, I would say a lot of times the lecturers do recommend books which you guys can go back to. So if you're not sure which type of learner you are, if you're not sure whether you're going to need the book or not, as I'm sure it might be a change as well from A-level where it's a lot more book-based and past papers, whereas now you have to explore your own style and do your own thing, I would say you might have a look at the book, try watching videos, try being there and actually examining things, see what works best for you and do that. Perhaps I could, thanks for that, I'd just add something that we have, of course, electronic resources available now as well. Uh, so there's one in particular called Clinical Key uh, that should be signposted from, for all of our programs, actually, um, where there are thousands of textbooks available electronically, and it's your own personal login. So you can go in and you can even highlight sections within the textbook, and then when you go back into it, you can find those highlights. So there's a lot available to you so that you don't have to purchase all of those textbooks, um, but obviously some students do prefer to have those paper copies in front of them. Yeah. Uh, so do make the most of some of those. And if you're doing anatomy, there's Complete Anatomy, which is a fantastic digital learning platform for anatomy that, that we use in the teaching, um, which is wonderful. You get all these 3D yeah. rotation constructions and stripping layers off and all sorts of things, and it's, uh, it's fabulous to work with. So do, do make the most of those digital tools. I'd say just to add on to that with Clinical Key, you can also download it on your iPhone or your iPad, and then you can um, download this thing which is the shelf, and you have your book on it. So as, um, as mentioned, you can go back and see your highlights and where you stopped. With Complete Anatomy as well, you can download it on your phone and it would be a different way of exploring your styles of learning. If you're a visual learner, you can do that as well. You rotate the models and whatnot and you can press find text about it. And they also do recommend the textbooks on there as well. We have a follow-up question on clinical key. Is that just for medical students or is it for other groups of students, including biomedical students? It's actually available to all students, so they should... Uh, let me know if that doesn't work, but my understanding is that they can all log in, so um, do flag that if it's a problem. Well, thank you very much for confirming that, John, and everybody knows who to contact if there's an issue. <laughs> yeah. um, we've got a question now around uh, study or placements abroad and uh, how uh, students may go about organising that. Um, yeah, so it depends on the programme. Um, and it's something that we're looking to increase as a university anyway uh, for all of our students. Um, my recommendation uh, is it, not necessarily something you would consider in your first year, uh, but during the year do start to find out from your program team uh, the availability of those um, study abroad opportunities. But we are increasing them, so I, I think if you do have an interest in that, uh, please uh, flag it to the program at some point. Maybe not in the first week or two, but after that. Thank you. So we've got a question around the international student uh, experience in regard to uh, integration. Yeah, so um, my advice for an international student, and, and the students here may have advice through their interactions with international students that I'd be interested to hear from, is uh, although you are obviously distinct and we provide additional support for you and you have your own groups, the main thing is to actually be involved in exactly the same activities as any other student. Treat yourself the same way as any other student. You are very welcome in everything that you do. We don't put a label on you that says you are an international student. And from what I see, most students are so fascinated with finding out about cultures in different parts of the world that they will be delighted to have you as part of their social groups, part of their academic networks. Um, so please just throw yourselves in to every opportunity that's available. I don't know if anybody yeah, wants to. I think to. I'd like to add to that, that as societies, we're all very inclusive. Um, we try to have people from all backgrounds in all of our societies. I think the one piece of advice that it would give as well is just throw yourself in, join the societies, network, meet people. And there should be no difference between meeting somebody from a different part of the UK and a different part of the world to you. Um, so just really just try to get involved as much as possible. Yeah, if I can add to that, because I'm an international student myself, um, being surrounded by international students, a lot of them are scared to come up because they're international. But as John's mentioned previously, do not, no one puts that label of an international student on you, so do not put it on yourself. The only thing I would get asked as an international student is where's your accent from? 
but that's pretty much it. Being the international rep as well, I can for MedSoc, I can guarantee there's a lot of events that happen to make sure to integrate international students. Try to show up to these events, try to show up to normal societies, because as mentioned, they're quite inclusive. And if you feel like you need help at any point, please feel free to reach out. It's okay to be lost at times, especially when you're in a completely different environment, surrounded by completely different people. But remember that even though you might be from a different country, a lot of people are from a different city as well and from different places. And they might be as lost or as unfamiliar as you are. And that's absolutely fine. Where is your accent from? Um, <laughs> so I'm ethnically Egyptian. I live in the UAE. But I think it's American because I'm in an international school. <laughs> Bit of a story there. <laughs> We've got a couple of uh, post-grad uh, uh, questions here which I'll link uh, uh, together. Uh, one is, uh, are master's students allowed to work in the Birmingham Clinical Trials Unit? And then uh, specifically regarding to the MPH uh, course, do students uh, get to do internships with some international organizations during or after the program? So on the first of those, whether they're allowed to work in the trials unit is a slightly complex one because it depends on your student and whether you're on visa etc and even for student numbers of hours um, whether the opportunities are there I'm afraid I really don't know the answer to that um, and you will actually have to talk um, to the program that you're in I, I don't know which program they might be on the masters in clinical trials or they might be in the master in public health so I, I would direct that type of very specific question through to the program team um, and equally for the masters in public health students um, again I'm not I'm afraid I don't have that level of knowledge, at least I don't retain it in my head. Um, so please ask them if there are those opportunities, um, and then hopefully they'll be able to tell you. Thank you, John. Uh, we have a dental question uh, here. Will there be opportunities for those studying dental hygiene and therapy if they uh, wish to go on and study dentistry to undertake a shorter course? Currently, um, there's the dentistry BDS is five years and you, they don't do a shorter course. Um, so you would have to do your three years dental hygiene therapy and then go on to do five years of BDS. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, there is a report uh, that's uh, just come out being updated this week called um, Advancing uh, Dentistry where uh, such options are being uh, discussed. So that is something uh, that may change uh, in the future, whether it changes in Birmingham or different parts of the country, I'm sure there'll be, there'll be a uh, mixed market there. Uh, but in terms of the, in terms of the question, uh, certainly that is something that's being uh, discussed, discussed nationally. Uh, here's a question that came up uh, the last time that I chaired one of these uh, uh, sessions. And uh, we all know that in examining subjects, that it's actually a sample of the material that uh, is, uh, is uh, delivered. But the question is, how do you know how much to learn is enough for the medicine course? Because the content would be overwhelming or impossible to learn all. I take that one? If you feel you're able to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so speaking from experience, um, I feel like with medicine there is a lot of details that are there, but a lot of them are examples to solidify your knowledge or to help you understand something. And I'd say at the beginning, yes, it is difficult to prioritize what you need to learn, and that is absolutely fine, granted that you've just started a new course, a completely different thing. But I feel like there are certain things that lecturers would stress out that make sense and there's certain things that have been repeated more than once that it's a clear sign that okay this sounds like it's quite relevant to know also if you think about it for more than just exams when you're reading something think of it will i need to know this when i'm treating my patient will i need to know this when i'm in clinics and this will often be a really good indicator it might sound a bit weird or not exactly the best answer you were looking for but trust me that's what i felt when i first got this answer but once you actually get on the course and you start getting into the more clinical aspect of things, you realize that there are certain things that are just given, for example, certain things that are given for just details, just for you to know how the procedure goes. What you need to know as a doctor is what you get examined about, hopefully. And yeah, that's how I've been doing it, and I think it's been working out. 
Uh, I would say that question applies to every subject uh, yeah. across the whole campus. I was, ju I was just going to say, uh, do any of our other student representatives have any comments they would like to make on that same question for their subject areas? Yes, yeah, so for dentistry, um, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed with the amount of content. And my advice is that uh, focus on your mental health really as, as busy as you do get on this course, you also need to have something that is a stress reliever and that it's, you do need to do all the lectures, yes, but there is a pass mark and I would suggest that you don't, try not to stress out too much about knowing everything. Try your best, but also have those times to unwind so that you can learn better thank you yeah i would add with nursing especially the content will seem very overwhelming and there is so much to learn and it's so different to everything you've learned in school but once you get out on placement because you're so much thrown straight into it you just find that all the content seems to fit almost so I would just sort of say to any nurses not to stress out too much about the content and about the skills and thinking, I don't know how to do this, I don't know how it will work. Because once you do get out on placement, once you've practiced a skill once, once or twice in the environment, you, you know how to do it. And everything starts relating. You start thinking, oh, I remember that from that lecture and now I know why it happens and why it makes sense. I would, I would definitely add that a huge part of my learning process was learning which things you need to learn and which you don't and and like you say it applies to every single course and just give yourself time to get there you'll change your learning style loads within the first few weeks maybe the first few months um, but don't be annoyed if you completely change how you do things because you're constantly developing and I'd say for biomedical science especially you might have 15 lectures for a subject and you might think oh I need to learn all the content for every single one of these but you'll start to find Find that actually four of them are around a very similar subject so if you leave it until after you've done those four lectures actually you can group them together and just make some really key sort of conclusions from from them as a whole rather than trying to learn each lecture individually um, so by the time you get to the end of your first year you'll have seen yourself develop massively as a learner so just give yourself a chance thank you pharmacy anything to add or are you yeah, happy it's all um, been covered the main difference between like a university student and an A-level student is that you're becoming an independent learner. So being able to teach yourself and understand what you need to know and why you need to know it, that's the skill you're going to pick up through studying at university. So I don't think you should worry about it too much, but um, keep it on your mind that you, you are becoming an independent learner and someone who needs to teach themselves things and, as well as learning it from a lecturer. Thank you. John? Uh, yeah, so some very good words of advice from the students. Uh, uh, on each of your modules, so each year of your program is divided into different modules, you will find the key learning outcomes listed on the module pages. Um, and as been mentioned, the lecturers will do their best to emphasize the key uh, points as they're going along. So it's always worth just referring back to those every so often so you don't get too carried away. Um, but obviously there is no end to learning. It's one of the fascinations of academia, of course. Um, so there's no right and wrong answer to that. Um, many of our courses, of course, are competency-based as well. Um, so because you're learning skills alongside it, um, in fact, all of them are to one degree or another. Uh, so it's important that you have enough knowledge to be able to apply that in context so that when you do the competency exams, you can demonstrate that level of competence that's required. Uh, so it's how it's all integrated together has been mentioned that I think is really important. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here uh, around uh, societies. Um, and I'll just put them both together. Are MedSoc societies for all medical and dental related uh, courses? And the second one is, is there specifically a biomed society or do we join uh, the BioSoc or uh, Meds, MedSoc? Maybe just a comment from each of our student representatives uh, on their uh, societies. So I'll just start to cover the okay. Biomed one. Um, so Biomed Society is a MedSoc Society. 
So, as biomedical science is one of the college of the medical school, part of the college, then you are very welcome to join MedSoc and join any of those societies. And also, as a biomedical science student, you are also automatically a part of the BioMedSoc. Um, so, it's all sort of integrated. Um, so, it's, they're all great opportunities, all of the societies. And then, of course, you can join normal university societies anyway. So, whatever takes your fancy, just go for it. Yeah, I think just to add to that, as I said on MedSoc, um, it's really important to re realize that they are very well integrated and we do have like a biomed rep on MedSoc as well. There's, the societies are also not just academic based and I think that's something that a lot of people need to realize. Like we have um, Tutti Frutti, I think it's called, that's a choir. We have um, Birmingham Leadership Society and that is leadership in general, getting involved in research, CV. So um, I think, yeah, MedSoc's pretty much inclusive of the College of Medical and Dental Sciences, including all the reps and all the, or all the respective courses. Thank you. I think with the nursing society, it's slightly different to the biomedical society from the sounds of things. So as a nursing student, you still have to sign up for the society. So that's on the Guild website, the same as you'd sign up for any society. But again, we are under the MedSoc. So the MedSoc is sort of the umbrella society. They look after all of the societies within that. And then within the MedSoc, there are countless societies there's sports as we said there's choir there's the biomed sock the pharmacy sock there's so much um so definitely try to get involved with as much as possible i think it can be quite daunting doing these kind of courses thinking you don't have time for that but there definitely is time and the good thing about being a med sock society is everyone's understanding everybody knows so there is everything's accounted for you can take days off a placement I think most of the societies run later because um, our lectures run later. So I definitely would recommend signing up to as many as possible. And as we said, we all have our own societies within the MedSoc. Yeah, I think if I can just add to that very briefly, um, th this is one of the main reasons we have a MedSoc, which is now under the Guild. It's because MedSoc, it has a lot of the societies that are also on campus. So we have MedSoc football, MedSoc rugby. It's the only difference is not because medics think they're cool or dentists think they're cool, because that is a common myth as well. The only reason is that it accommodates for the schedule because we finish sometimes a lot later than other courses and placement and whatnot, so that is accommodated for. So if anything, it should be a push that even though you might have a lot of studies, you can definitely do it and it does accommodate for your schedule and a lot of people are understanding as mentioned. Erin? So dentistry is a bit different. We have buds and wearing their polo right now I'm the treasurer and buds is not a part of medsoc um, we're a completely separate society and I believe we're actually the oldest dental society at least in the UK uh, for students um, so buds we run different it's specifically for um, it's for BDS so and dentistry students and also for dental hygiene and therapy students and we have um, bud sports we have the football and the netball teams um, and the golf and then all of our separate events so we're completely separate from uh, MedSoc um, but we're also part of the guild thank you Ashmal Pharmacy all right so um, I was a PharmSoc president last year and um, PharmSoc, PharmSoc is more about an independent body where we do our own events but um, it's, it's important to know that MedSoc is an umbrella term and you can go into those smaller societies within that. Like I was on the microbiology committee as well as the clinical pharmacology committee. So you can join different committees and be part of those. It's important that you do because there's a lot of opportunities that you might not hear about from PharmSoc but you should, you'll be available to join if you are part of MedSoc. John. Yeah, I mean, thank you for the comments. It's, it's really nice to hear that you have the same view that I do. Um, but just to emphasize, MedSoc is an all-inclusive society. Uh, I think the name makes it sound a bit exclusive. That's mm. just historical. Um, it is an umbrella organization, as, as has been pointed out. It is a, as part of the guild. It moved across into the guild a couple of years ago. Um, everyone can join MedSoc. You are very welcome, and there are many, many societies in there. And as you've heard, then there are additional societies, either within MedSoc or in the case of BUDS outside of it, um, that you can uh, also be a part of. Um, so everything's there. You are never excluded, so you are always very welcome. Uh, thanks, John. So now we've got a question around uh, well-being support. 
Yeah, now, our well, <laughs> she's going to kill me for this. Is Becky still there? You don't have a microphone down your end, do you, Becky? No, Becky's saying no, because she probably doesn't want to speak anyway. Um, she's in charge of the well-being for our college. Uh, so we have a number of well-being officers um, in the college uh, who will respond to the requests coming through to them. I I'll ask the students to comment in a moment, because some of them may have had dealings with the service. Um, we have increased the number of well-being officers. We have increased the provision of well-being for our students um, over the last few years. Uh, there's also now a 24-7 helpline whose name escapes me at this point in time. Hopefully somebody will remember. Is it Nightline? Is it the Nightline? It's not the Nightline. There's a, a new organisation that we've signed up with that provides 24-7 support. I'm embarrassed that I can't remember that. Um, hopefully... Is it Yobi Pause? No. <laughs> Becky hopefully will know and she'll actually <laughs> type a question in. It's part of You Be Heard, is it? Thank you, Becky. So you be heard. Um, I knew I wouldn't remember everything today. Um, so yeah, that, pr that provision is there, that support is there, and you must reach out if you're struggling and do it early on. Um, they will tri triage you appropriately. Of course, different people require different levels of support at different times during their degree program, and, it, and we do recognize that, and, it, it, and it's really important. You all have personal academic tutors. They are there to support you primarily academically, that doesn't mean that they won't ask you how you are and how it's all going, but they are not professionals in well-being. They will refer you through to the well-being team if you haven't already referred yourself. So we do try and keep the two slightly separate, but acknowledging that, of course, they will talk to each other. So I don't know if any of you want to comment on anything. Yeah, I think what's quite important to add is um, to not be afraid to ask for help. We're all doing very challenging courses. We're all doing courses where you go on placement, you see things, you do things. It's a big jump and there's all these people in place. There are all these provisional things that it's really not an embarrassing thing to reach out. And if it was, we wouldn't have these things in place. So really, really the wellbeing team for the med school are phenomenal and it really, they are worth to speak to. Um, and as John mentioned, there are other people, if you don't feel comfortable, your personal tutors, they'll signpost you. Your fellow students will be able to signpost you to people who they've known of. So don't be afraid to ask for help and really do reach out and use these services that are available for you. Yeah, um, the, for dentistry, uh, we've got a wellbeing officer, I believe it's Erica, um, and she's lovely. And we also have a in buds we have a well-being rep, um, well-being and inclusive, inclusivity. Um, so there's always someone you can talk to. There's also uh, university offers counselling, um, which could be really helpful. And I think just if you talk to people, you'll you'll find that lots of people are are having some difficulties, and they're maybe not saying it to everyone like they're friends with but if you actually talk to them about these things they lots of people are getting this support so really if you need it just re reach out to your well-being officer it really does help yeah sorry if i just may add to that as well in medical school besides having very helpful staff and well-being officers we also have in curriculum curriculum and well-being committee we have a well-being rep who is a student and she has other well-being reps under her. We also have a year rep system so each year has a rep. Feel free to reach out to any of these if you need help, like if you feel academically stressed or if you need any help with well-being in general. They will try and help you as much as they can and if not they will refer you. And again just to reiterate what they've said, it's absolutely fine not to be okay at times and a lot of the times you just think people around you know what they're doing but they might be equally lost and everyone has phases where they go through, go through things and that is fine so please please do not be afraid to um, ask for help do not think you're burdening anyone we all would love to help you and I speak for myself personally as well can I just add something that I forgot um, I'm not quite sure how it works with other courses but with nursing when you go on placement you'll actually have a practice education team that works in your hospital so they go they work across the different trusts so they're really important people to make sure you have their contact details of for when you're on placement if you have well-being issues then as well as that your academic and your um, placement supervisors and assessors are the type of people to speak to so if 
you're struggling with your well-being whilst on placement, they might be good people to speak to as well as the university staff. So I just wanted to make you clear of those. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're nearing the end of the session and uh, this will be our last question. We've got one uh, question uh, left which I've saved uh, to the uh, end. I'll start with you, Laura, and if we can work along the line. Uh, what is the best thing about studying at the University of Birmingham? Um, the campus. So you're on campus today, you're in the Great Hall. I will purposely walk the long way back home from the medical school just to be able to walk through the centre of campus. Um, and like John mentioned earlier, just seeing students everywhere at the moment makes it all better. Um, it's even greater with everyone around. So um, make sure you go and explore all the different buildings. You're welcome into pretty much all of the buildings. Um, so go and have a look around and find your favourite place to study um, and study in lots of different places and go to all the cafes and just enjoy and make the most of your time here. I 100% echo what Laura said. I'm a second year, so I've not even seen that much of campus having only started last year during COVID. And this past week, being able to see it has been just so lovely. I also think one of the best things about UAB is the community. I think that sort of, we've seen a few of your faces today and I know that I'll be happy to walk around and just give you a little smile and a nod because we've met. And I think most people on campus are like that. It's a university that really echoes community and looking out for each other and well-being and I think that as students we all follow in the footsteps of that ethos and there's just such a nice sort of community especially in the med school as well so if you ever do get lost or are struggling give any one of us a shout and we'll or anyone around you and anyone will be happy to help. Uh, for me it's probably the diversity of like the amount of different people you can meet and come across going to different societies it was just a bit it was fascinating Especially coming from Birmingham, you, you know, I don't really meet too many people before university, so being able to meet international students and like, talking to them and understanding who they are, that was probably the most fascinating thing that I came across. I really like Birmingham's facilities um, as well as the campus. Um, there's so many new buildings. I f <laughs> I, every time I walk a, around campus, there's something I haven't seen before. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that the dental hospital, I believe it's the newest dental hospital, um, and it's state of the art. We were one of the few dental schools that were able to get up and running, and I really owe it to, we all owe it to the amazing facilities and the staff did s such a good job at just getting us up and running again. So, yeah, the facilities are amazing. Thank you. Okay, and obviously I agree with all of these, and whenever you guys are speaking, I'm like, okay, I have to put something different in now. So I feel, um, I would say I really like the balance and how they've made it very possible for you to be socially active and how they've allowed me to grow person, like, as a person. Coming into university as a 17-year-old, as an international student, was not as easy as you might imagine and I feel they've hosted a lot of events on campus going to explore the different sites on campus seeing how inclusive they are seeing the diversity and seeing the incredible opportunities you have to meet that many people seeing the facilities on campus and how you feel much more um, tempted to go in rather than just stay in is all factors that put into it um, I just think there is a lot that you can do if you go out of your way and put yourself out there there's a lot of events happening just seeing freshers and like you said it's quite heartwarming to see people coming back to campus see all these events all the different cultures or the people from the different backgrounds it's quite an opportunity to get integrated and make friends not just within your course but outside it to grow as a person to try new things and yeah just explore I think one really important thing to add as well is that being at university in Birmingham and obviously all being medical subjects we are really privileged with also the hospitals and the trusts that we have around us that obviously is quite academic and not as fun as the community but it is a really great thing about um, going to this uni you know having placements in uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, the Birmingham Women and Children's, the dentistry hospitals that we have around here. Uh, those are things that really make the experience as well as the community and the campus itself. I've got something else to add. Um, thinking about as a fresher, there were so many events uh, held um, at the Vale 
and I just say just get really get involved with them because I miss those events. <laughs> um, they yeah, so really get involved because those events are so good. I think, sorry, just one last thing to add. So sorry to keep you. Um, there's also a lot of support around CV advice, going out for electives and stuff like that. And I feel try and find out as much resources as you can reach out. There's a lot of things that are available that people might not be necessarily aware of, are aware of or are care to reach out for. So again, I feel like to echo what a lot of us have been saying, it's all a matter of putting yourself out there and not being scared. Granted, it might be a bit um, scary at the at start, but that's absolutely fine. Just put yourself out there and try new things. It's your chance to start from scratch. You're in a new environment with new people. Thank you. Am I allowed to say anything? Just, you're not allowed to speak just yet. Now, one of the things that I know uh, that's the, one of the best things for uh, studying at the University of Birmingham is uh, that you have uh, Professor Kerner as your ultimate uh, advocate on uh, student matters. I regularly witness that uh, on college executive and at college board uh, first hand. He really does a fabulous job of representing you and having said that John, last word to you. Thank you very much, um, very kind of you. Um, I didn't pay him to say that by the way. Um, well I am biased and I would say it's our staff of course, um, but our staff are only wonderful because of the wonderful students that we have here. Um, things I would point out though is the hidden gems that maybe even our existing students haven't been to yet. Uh, the Barber Institute for Fine Arts is quite extraordinary. You would have to pay a lot of money uh, to go to a museum of that quality. Uh, the Lapworth Museum, the Geology Museum is worth a visit. Winterbourne Gardens is a beautiful, if you're feeling stressed, take yourself off to Winterbourne Gardens on a nice day. It's absolutely beautiful. The city itself is a lot, for those who aren't from Birmingham, it's so much better than people expect. Birmingham has a growing reputation for being a, a vibrant and a very young city, um, so do make the most of that. Of course, we have the Commonwealth Games coming here next year. Please do get involved in that as well. Um, even if you're not that sporting, there'll be lots of activities going on. So for all sorts of reasons, uh, and I know I am biased, but for all sorts of reasons, it is a fabulous place to study. Well, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much to our panel. Thank you very much to uh, the organisers for uh, bringing all this together for us. Special thanks to those of you who are here in person and also to uh, those online. I uh, hope you got something uh, out of the event. It's been my uh, privilege to uh, host it. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs>